from the uh, from the ongoing survey work that the Ministry of Health has been a part of, just to understand what information New Zealanders have needed as they've made their vaccine decisions, that's been a, a consistent theme that actually the group of people who are strongly anti-vaccination remains relatively small. But as you can see, you know they, they can be quite quite vocal. And key for us, I think, in New Zealand uh, going forward is still to create a place though, despite the fact that people have very strongly held views either side where people can still raise questions because the only way that we will ever move people or enable uh, decisions to be made in favour are if they're able to talk openly about whatever concerns they might have. The, the latest data that's been published by the Ministry of Health shows that 4.6% of eligible Kiwis are hardcore yep. anti-vax. Yep. There's 188,000 New Zealanders and I really don't want to um, rabble rouse here in any way but those kinds of numbers could potentially pose a threat, couldn't they? Well, look, actually, you know, in those numbers, as I say, that's been fairly consistent, and it is a, I consider that to be a small group. If we're able to uh, reach every other New Zealander that gives us the opportunity to have as many as 95% of our eligible population vaccinated, you know, and in one DHB, we're actually not that far off it. It demonstrates the high level of vaccination we can reach, even now, even at the rates we have now, we're fast becoming one of the highly vaccinated countries in the world and that gives an extra level of protection to New Zealand that will prevent hospitalisations and will protect communities. The data also shows that of that hardcore anti-vax, 68% are Pākehā, just 18% are Māori. Given that Māori are so much more likely to die from COVID-19, do you acknowledge we have a problem where Pākehā are spreading misinformation and putting Māori lives at risk? Do you know, what, I, what I've noticed is that there seems to be also, a, a, there seems to be a split in, in different age ranges, you know, because when you look at the data of where we've got really good coverage with the vaccine, uh, it is in those higher age groups, regardless of ethnicity. So really solid high rates amongst Pacific communities, Māori communities, and of course so um, the rest. 68% versus 18% Māori. Is but again, a... just to break that down, that doesn't seem to be prevalent amongst more of our 50 plus. It does seem to be our younger people. And those younger people are more exposed to social media. There is more disinformation available online. And they are potentially more inclined to also believe that um, that they're safe. So you're right, there is there is misinformation. It is hitting particular communities, and we do have a job to do to reach those young people. Your COVID-19 response minister sent the country into a tailspin this week with this kind of bizarro idea that you'd have to apply to the government for annual leave, basically, time slots to get out of well, Please tell me you're not serious. I wouldn't describe it that. in that way. Look, here's the, here's the simple issue that we have. We are all totally committed to ensuring, and this is a bottom line for us, Aucklanders need to be able to move around for summer and for Christmas. So then the question becomes, how do you do that in the safest way possible? Uh, some of the options, of course, um, canvassed have been use of vaccine certificates, um, testing is an option. All of that requires a land boundary, which, of course, we've tended to use for short periods of time and for small numbers of people. But please so, tell me you're ruling out the, the yeah. time slot idea. That just sounds look, yeah. onerous Yeah, so look, we've got to find something workable. Here's the challenge, though, 30 to 40,000 people needing to move all at once. So yep. we've just got to figure out a way to make sure that people aren't stuck in queues for long periods of time. No decisions have been taken, no decisions, but Except that's the dilemma. Except to rule out those time slots, because we understand your ninth floor office was not all too yeah. impressed so, with his very public musing. So I've shared with you now the issue that we are working through. Large amount of people all wanting to move at once. We want to make it as smooth as we can, but one thing I will say to Auckland is, we are not going to keep you trapped over Christmas. We can't, we won't, it's not right, um, but we have to find a way that we can continue to keep people safe. So how, how will it work? Are you able to give us any more certainty at, around that, allowing Orphans stage. to reunite with their families? No, no, not at this stage. What, I, what I'd not like to do is, again, fuel speculation about something before we can actually answer all of the questions. But that is the, the issue we're working through with officials. Our bottom line is to allow movement. Our second objective is safety. Because people need to start booking their flights, making their plans now, costs are only going to go up, places are going to get booked up. How much, for example, do you think a flight from Auckland to Dunedin so could, thing, could cost? The one thing that I would, oh look, I, I simply can't speculate. Take, take what, a guess, take, I, take a guess. I, What's look, a return airfare Auckland to Dunedin? Look, I could not, at this, Dunedin has always been a uh, an ex, what I would consider to be an expensive Eight, route. $859, as, as Prime has Minister. As the East Coast. 
Um, but if, if I may, you know, one thing we do know is regardless of the settings or the checks that may or may not be in place, uh, I c we consider that those that airflow will, will continue as it has throughout. The checks have always been in place um, at our airports. And, and so that is probably the area where you'll see uh, less disruption because we've already got those mechanisms in place. They've already been working for some time and it will just be a matter of scale. Yeah, but people need to book those flights because $859 paying international airfares to travel south isn't tenable. People need that certainty to start booking and now. Look, so as we've just said, the certainty I can provide is that we will have movement. What I cannot do um, from this role is put on more flights. Those are commercial No, but can decisions. they start booking from the 15th of December, for example? And look, of the course, 20th of December. Of when course, can they start booking their and holidays? And of course we need to make sure that we provide those timelines as soon as we're able to. But I've just shared the challenge that we're working through. The vast majority of Aucklanders do tend to move via vehicle. Of course, they're seeking to have holidays as well. So we're working through those things as quickly as we can. And if you One of, of course, the challenges is if the rest of the country has those high rates of vaccination, it simplifies everything right down. You so, know? yeah, have you drawn a line under opening the border only for double vaxxed? Oh, at this stage, that is one of the things that we still have under consideration because, you're, as you can imagine, that is something that we have to make sure that we've got very clear advice on, you know, legally, the ability to use things like vaccination certificates around the movement of people. One thing I will say, this is temporary. That hard border is not going to remain there forever. It is doing a job now while we have a highly vaccinated Auckland and an outbreak, but the rest of the country is still vaccinating. And so that's the role it's providing. It will not be there forever. So for the sake of clarity, if you're not vaccinated, you will not be leaving Auckland this year. We have not made as cabinet those final decisions, but vaccine certificates is one of the options we are considering to ensure the safety of others. It will not be a long-term mechanism, though. This can, is for the here and now. Can you give us more of a sense of that time frame? How Well, of how course, temporary? our goal is that we... Oh, how temporary? Mm. Of course, when we have high vaccination rates across the rest of the country, the COVID protection framework, what people are calling the traffic light, yeah. it is not designed to have hard borders dividing up New Zealand. And that's because it's based on the idea of having good high rates of vaccination across the country. And what about you? Are you planning your usual jaunts to Tairafti to Gisborne and, <laughs> and to the Coromandel this summer? Yeah, well, to be honest, I haven't um, changed any of my plans, but nor have I made many at the moment. That's simply for the fact that I've been focused on the work we're doing here. But as I've said, my commitment is to, to Aucklanders is that they will have a summer break. My commitment is to New Zealand, and this is what we're working very hard on. Everyone needs a reprieve right now. People are COVID exhausted. I want that reprieve, that break to happen over summer. Because Tairawhiti is the least vaccinated region, so presumably you won't be going to Gisborne. And then can you give an assurance that those low One vaccinated... One thing I'll say is, of course, uh, uh, my, the COVID response is not based on my holiday plans. No, I know, but you're an example of a Kiwi like the rest of us trying to make trying to make plans for summer. Well, what I and would so say is... The, the, the question I want to ask is if Tairawhiti, those low vaccinated areas like Tairawhiti, like Northland, if they're not at 90% when the rest of us are, will you border well, them? Will well, you this border is them why the consideration is actually around the border around Auckland because that is where the outbreak is. But could you do And a so, therefore, it is about trying to uh, ensure that we contain the outbreak as much as we can and the tools we have are vaccines. Uh, both within Auckland but outside of Auckland as well and testing and when we have that extra information and we have of course made those decisions we'll share them with ample time for people to be able to plan. Is that one of the options you open the Auckland border but have a Northland border for example to protect Northland if it's not yet at, at 90? My goal of course is that we keep lifting rates so that becomes less of an issue we don't want pockets of the issue. country but again, as I say, when we've made decisions and we have more clarity, we'll share it. And that is on the table. Uh, look, again, the focus to date has been the border we already have. Okay. Can I read you something? This is from an interview you did with my good friend Claire Trevet just three months ago. One three thing, months ago feels three like a lifetime, but continue. Indeed, indeed. But um, one thing I do and ruled out was a vaccination pass within New Zealand. A quote from you, people wouldn't consider it freedom of movement if you're only able to go and partake in activities if you're vaccinated. Do you, do you stand by that statement? Because just two months after you said that, you 
announced those very mandates that you'd ruled out? Yeah, well, look, one of the things all the way through, of course, we've looked at international evidence and examples of what has worked, what's really supported reopening and greater freedoms. And of course, my hope would be that in an ideal world, you'd be so highly vaccinated that you wouldn't need things like vaccine certificates. And so that would be an ideal that I would have hoped that we could have because that would be, uh, it would reduce down issues for consumers carrying them. It makes it easier for businesses. But what businesses have also sought for us and the public is greater certainty. So the alternative to not using vaccine certificates is actually you don't bring back events You do have issues in times when you close down facilities because you can't guarantee safety. The use of these passes, yes, may be seen by some as restrictions, but by others as a way of creating greater freedom and certainty. Now, I don't want a situation where people feel excluded, but the one way to overcome that is actually to be vaccinated. I mean, hard out, we all want to live in a um, COVID-free utopia, but by rolling those those passes out two months before you announce them, it looked, Prime Minister, like you lacked foresight, like you got complacent with the time that well, the team no, of five actually, million, I please let me finish if I may, the team, the time that the team of five million bought you to prepare for the inevitability ah, of Delta. Well there I will dispute you strongly, actually all the way through this, uh, not just this outbreak, but this pandemic, we have been utterly consistent. If we have found tools that will enable us to support what has been our consistent goal, of writing a rule book for New Zealand that protects our lives and our livelihoods, we will use them. What I will, again, just push back really strongly here, we have been developing um, passports for the purposes of international travel for some time, preparing their use. That enables us equally to apply those domestically. So if the argument you've made is somehow that there was an issue with us not preparing that groundwork, I would say that is wrong. We have not uh, ever at any moment sat unprepared for the option of using some of these tools. I'll come back to that in just a second, but but because because you rolled them out and then came around to the idea... Push it, Togo, I don't actually believe that I did in that black and white way. Yes, my preference was to have an environment and my preference would continue to be an environment where we don't have to use tools like that, but we do. But we, Israel, we do, is, and so we have used them, but I don't believe I've ever been as black and white as you've maintained. But we're only just scraping to get them through now ahead of the summer holidays. Israel had them ready in February. I disagree. China had them ready in, in March. Well, no, well, actually, well, they've had a very different system, and I'm not sure that you'd be advocating that we would do that. Um, but what we have designed is something that's actually being trialled from next week. We already have the ability to deliver something that's paper-based. We want something that's digitally enabled in the same way our scanner has been able to be very accessible. Okay, and will those vaccine passes, just to your earlier point, will those vaccine passes be accepted as vaccine passports for yeah. international travel? Yeah, so we've developed um, a vaccine passport uh, that, for the purposes of international travel um, that is compatible with, for instance, the schemes that are being used by the EU uh, so that people, that New Zealanders, will have the ability to um, to move around internationally with, right. with proof of vaccination. Because I'll give you one example. A girlfriend of mine went to Germany recently. They wouldn't accept her proof of New Zealand vaccination. She had to travel to Switzerland, pay a hundred bucks to get a digital passport. But you can give a cast iron assurance that our vaccine passes will be acceptable for venues overseas and for international travel. So we are designing something that will work at the border for other countries and that will fulfil the needs of other countries to demonstrate you have been vaccinated. Of course, anyone who is travelling before then is, of course, able uh, to uh, also get physical proof of their vaccine before they depart New Zealand. Why have you cancelled your trip to Europe? Oh, well, actually, I, would be, uh, I wouldn't have described it as having been fully formed anyway. Um, we, as you know, gave some notice that it was something that we had been giving some thought to. We did not confirm it because, as I said, two considerations for me, first and foremost, domestic. What matters most to me is the situation we're in and whether or not the timing is right. But the other reason uh, primarily was around our free trade negotiations. Um, Both factors to do with those negotiations, but also domestically, mean the timing now for me sits best in the the new year. Was it also that you recognised that taking up those spots in MIQ would have just been such a kick in the guts to those Kiwis who can't come home? and reunite with their families because... A bit you know, of a with, with, Well, with respect, the MIQ system is a, is a joke. Now. So, uh, well, of course, I wouldn't agree with you on that. Um, but, of course, for me, the primary factors were actually the role that I need to play domestically and also within the free trade negotiations. Those were my two driving decision-making. 
Uh, of course, with every minister that has travelled, and there have only been two mm. since we have had an MIQ system, two who have travelled. We have been very cautious in our use of travel. We have only used it where it has made a material difference and benefit to New Zealand, and I think most New Zealanders would appreciate that. But we know that with James Shaw, for example, it didn't sit well with him. So would it have sat well with you to have taken up one of those MIQ spots when that's a family who couldn't get home? I would only have done that on the basis that I knew that it would make a material difference to New Zealand businesses and exporters. Uh, and that would be my consideration. But of course, the decision on whether we would or we wouldn't We'd never formally locked it in. The consideration for me was both domestic and the status of our trade arrangements. Having the, the stays in, um, in MIQ is all very well, but it doesn't even scratch the, the surface, does it, for those returning Kiwis? The only logical option for them is, is home isolation. Why are you waiting until March next year to bring that in? Yeah, so we have said that, of course, we're at the moment uh, trialling uh, the checks and balances that we need to have a place for successful home isolation. So we need to keep in mind that actually all of our uh, experts, our public health experts, our epidemiologists, all talk about the fact that the more cases that you seed into the community, the greater the risk of large-scale outbreaks. And so our careful consideration is once you have home-based isolation, you do still need to have checks and balances around it. And once you're allowing back New Zealand citizens uh, that uh, where there is no limit on the numbers, that could be up to 30 to 40,000 people a week. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a system that's able to adequately manage in-home isolation, uh, that is potentially a large number of COVID cases in the community. But again, you've had time to prepare for that. It's been more than a year between the first outbreak and the Delta outbreak. So you could have had a plan in place. Is there any and chance? from can you give August, we were laying the foundations for what we're doing now. Keep in mind, I doubt many New Zealanders would have welcomed us isolating at home, potentially people with COVID cases, in an elimination environment. Well, perhaps, where we had, yeah, but now when there we had more COVID cases at the supermarket than there are at Where the we border. had zero tolerance. And now we are also home isolating. So we have people from overseas who are isolating at home as part of that trial as we speak. We've indicated that in the new year we'll use that more broadly to enable New Zealanders to come Is home. Is there any chance you could bring that forward though so that maybe some more Kiwis can get home for Christmas to see their families? Yeah and of course we have had some additional places available because of the shortening. But my job is to make sure that when they come home, we still have an environment where, yes, we are right now transitioning into a new system. If we do not go through that transition carefully, I don't want them coming home to an environment where they have probably experienced already the ravages of COVID. It's got to be careful, cautious and considered. And the border is the one lever that once you pull it, it's very hard to put back. It's been well traversed that we were slow off the mark with our vaccine rollout. At the time you rationalised it saying the equation was different because, quote, our people aren't dying. But our, our uh, people... To, our... Be, to be clear, that, that, is, uh, that is not a fair interpretation. So uh, we were right in amongst those early adopters of agreements with pharmaceutical companies to access vaccine doses. Uh, where we were then in the order of delivery and supply was never a decision New Zealand was able to make, but pharmaceutical companies. I understood where we sat though, because our experience with COVID has been vastly different to others. Having said that, the countries who did start earlier, we have now overtaken and have more vaccinated individuals than the likes of Israel, the UK and others. And, but, uh, and now our, pe our people are dying. What, what is the current COVID death toll to date? 28 individuals. Of course, we have under investigation some uh, another in play that so you'll 20, be aware of. 28 deaths, but too many. Can you just commit, Prime Minister, for the many. next stage of the rollout with of the boosters? Of course, too many. But um, we have now a tool to help us maintain what I must say is one of the lowest death rates of countries who have experienced COVID in the OECD. So that we also must keep in mind. Can you commit to being more ambitious perhaps with the next stage of the rollouts, with the booster shots and with the rollout to five 11 year olds? I would question what ambition looks like if it's not having one of the highest rates of vaccination amongst countries that we would compare ourselves to and one of the lowest death rates. Okay, will we be so, more prepared then, good to go, straight out of the traps? Because looking over at the United States, the CDC approved um, their uh, paediatric vaccine the very next day, five to 11 year olds were rolling up their sleeves for the jabs. President Biden was committing 
to that being full steam within yeah, a week. And will so we be actually, the... let's apply let's apply then what happened with um, the uh, twelve um, plus range. There are some parts of Europe that are still uh, not vaccinating their children um, or who are giving one dose. We move very quickly on that development once we considered it safe. I want so to talk about the commitment that I'll make on the paediatric doses. Thanks. First, it will go through a process. I will not ask parents to do anything that we have not made sure has gone through our own system. So Pfizer need to make an application to New Zealand. That needs to happen first. Once that happens, we'll move through MedSafe, our experts, and then we have already talked to them about securing those doses before that. So we've already done that. Then it comes down to the delivery of those doses and once we have them, we'll start. Okay, so as soon as those doses are in the country, will we be good to go within a week to start rolling them as out? As soon as they're in the country, olds? we will be ready. But okay. we've got to make sure we go through our systems and processes to give people confidence. And what about the booster shots? Dr Bloomfield says they're going to be available by the end of November. When will everyone have access by? Yeah, so that's again, once we had the data, we started that process very quickly. We've already got the doses available to us for booster shots. We'd already done that as part of our planning. So as soon as uh, we have the decision from our experts, uh, you can see we've already got the infrastructure to roll that out. So it'll be a matter of sequencing. Uh, as soon as we have the time frame for which our experts suggest from the last shot to then the booster, We'll then make sure we move through all of those age bands in the in the uh, sequence that they were first vaccinated. How many border workers haven't yet received their first jab? I think it was 1,600 back in August. But do you know that now all border workers have either had their second jab or been moved out of those roles? Well, of course, we keep the data on that. I'd be happy to go and look at it. But yes, according to the order, uh, they have to be a new worker entering the workforce. Um, if they're already employed, they have to be um, double vaccinated. But if you're a new worker, you get a bit of time to be vaccinated. And we noticed when we were researching for this interview that the no jab, no job mandate for the high risk health workers um, had actually changed. It was that uh, they were supposed to be fully vaxxed by the uh, 1st of December, now it's the 1st of January. Why are those changing? So a simple, adjust, an adjustment there made over the fact that there's a portion of health care workers in our home care based workforce who are often contracted or in employment relationships that makes it um, somewhat more difficult for us to uh, register and confirm state vaccination status. So it's more the employment arrangements of a group of healthcare workers that have been caused to just give a bit of time to make sure that those contracted workers are able to be registered as having been vaccinated. Gotcha. What's the percentage of Māori who are not yet fully vaccinated? So we had, we were up to first dose uh, at 72% uh, last I looked earlier in the week. The number are not um, yet fully vaccinated. Uh, so I can't give you the raw numbers, but if you take a 72% as a first dose is indicative of what's possible on second dose, um, then of course, and I'm not giving up there, we want to keep driving those rates up. It's 46%, so that's 263,000 people, nearly half, keep nearly half mind, of the eligible mode Keep in mind, Tova, some of those have been, we have seen an acceleration recently, that's why I look at first dose well, as still, an indication of what we're likely to achieve okay, for fully apple, vaccinated. Apples and apples then, 155,000 with no dose. Do you take any responsibility for that? Well, our job is to make sure that we vaccinate as many people as possible. Our job is to reach as many members of our Māori community as possible. People so that is been able our to job. Get to vaccine clinics because is... they're so far away or they're not open when they need to go. Oh well, and if there is any region where anyone raises an issue of access, we will be straight in there bringing in those mobile clinics. Penny Hinare is on the road as we speak, speaking to individual providers, DHBs and on the ground, ascertaining if there are indeed any hurdles for people being able to reach the vaccinations that we want them to reach. Given the situation in Northland, what's your understanding of the plans for Waitangi commemorations next year? Uh, I actually haven't touched base recently uh, with um, the Trust Board who's involved with those commemorations. So to be honest, I'm not sure the current status um, our goal is to be an environment and a place where we have good vaccination rates, um, good ongoing management of COVID locally so that we are in a position to continue to meet. I talked to someone from the Trust Board yesterday and they are meeting today mm. and on the table is, is cancelling the commemorations. How does that sit with you? Well, look, these de decisions are, uh, are for the individual trust. The issue is at the moment, of course, that um, people are trying to look into the future and predict 
uh, where vaccination rates will be. And they need to start planning status. now. You oh, know? and, and no one understands that situation more than us. We have, of course, in constant contact with those running events, um, uh, those running festivals. We know the need for certainty. COVID does make planning difficult. We're trying to create an environment where we can support those organisers, regardless of the amount of information we have right now. Because they've told us that passports aren't workable there, vaccination rates are too low in Northern, they don't want to be a super spreader event, they will have unvaccinated people coming there, and because of the large Māori population up in Te Tai Tokoro, is it inevitable that Waitangi will be cancelled. They want guidance from you. What do you recommend? Oh, look, you know, that is a decision ultimately for the organisers. But there are some uh, particular circumstances where, you know, absolutely right, there are some events where, of course, it's just not practical to check people's vaccinations. What do you you recommend? And I would be happy for the health team to work alongside those event organisers, and that's probably more useful than me conveying public health information as a non-expert via an interview with the nation. But wouldn't that be gutting if our National Day commemorations... Do Do you know what, you know, I just... Two days ago, spoke with um, uh, the health minister in Denmark. I speak frequently with friends and family in other parts of the world. Yes, we are experiencing right now the uncertainty and the anxiety of a pandemic, but there is no country in the world currently untouched by that. So our measure of success is not whether or not we're having to deal with COVID, because everyone is. Our measure of success is whether or not we're doing it in a way that is keeping our people as safe as possible and trying to see, reconnect and enjoy time with the ones we love. So that has always been my guiding principle and it continues to be. We've got Official Information Act documents which show that taxpayer money was spent on focus grouping, so popularity, testing, your personal Facebook lives. Are you aware of that? No, no, I'm not aware of that. And distinction I'll draw is that what you'll have OIAs on is the uh, uh, work that DPMC and the COVID team do predominantly, and I do know predominantly because I've been asked questions on this before, predominantly ascertaining the public uh, questions or issues around vaccination and accessing vaccines. We do need to know the information people need. If we don't know what is driving hesitation, then we can't respond to it. I don't think anyone would begrudge you wanting to make sure your COVID communications are clear. It's important public health messaging, but why are taxpayers, why am I paying for your labour branded Facebook page to be polled Well, well, to be honest, I have no awareness or knowledge of that. Um, I would want to go and look at that myself. The spending of the comms team on any research within the COVID directorate, which is a part of a public service directorate, is not something that they either seek guidance or confirmation from me on. And that is right. They do make those decisions themselves. So you don't know how much money was spent on that? No, but I do know the last time I was asked questions around the research work that by far and away the focus was on uh, issues around vaccination and hesitancy. It's just that catch-all, isn't it? And the ACT Party says it's actually creeping into corruption territory. It's going to write to the Auditor General. Will you just commit to looking into it and paying it back? Well, look, first and foremost, I will absolutely look into it. But as I've just said to you, I have no knowledge of that. Um, And, you know, on my Facebook page, which I run, um, I have no awareness of any such research. But what I do know is in the past when we've been asked about it, it has predominantly been around how do we ensure people have vaccine information they need. And uh, we've talked about this before, but I'd say you've probably dealt with more crises in your time as Prime Minister than any post-war Prime Minister. Do you ever get sick of it? Or how long do you think you've got in you? Have you got another term in you? Well, I've only just been um, just been re-elected. You know, and you even regardless of that was almost the a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, uh, time time does um, has is doing strange things for everyone right now. You know, regardless of the fact that you can't anticipate what you'll come up against in this in this job, I still consider this to be the greatest privilege of my life. And because, you know, yes, we are in, you know, the, the biggest health crisis of a generation, frankly, going back to 1918 and uh, a significant economic crisis as well. Uh, and yet to be, uh, to be the person who is able to steward New Zealand through that time, despite the difficulties that it presents, I still consider it an honour. Sounds like she's got two terms left in there <laughs> if the voters hand it to her. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm not stopping. I'm, I, need to, I need to carry us through. It's my job.
And this might be the last time we do this on this show. So as a parting gift, I'd like to invite you to New South Nations end of year Christmas special on December the, the 4th. Can we count on your presence, Prime Minister? It sounds a delight. Great. <laughs> See you there. That Thank is you. not confirmation. That is definitely <laughs> confirmation. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank your time, you. Prime Minister. I appreciate it. Thank you.